Good afternoon and welcome to today's Digital Leaders Week webinar, The RegTech Revolution, Helping Conduct Culture and Compliance. Thank you for logging on today. The 2017 is proving to be a year in which RegTech gains prominence and emerges from the shadow of fintech. The sector is brimming with innovative ideas that, have, um, that can help regulated firms address regulatory requirements in an efficient and cost-effective way. My name is Louise Stokes and I'm the head of online at Digital Leaders and you can contact me on Twitter with the handle at DigiLeaders. Um, if you haven't participated in a Digital Leaders webinar before, we really encourage lots of questions um, uh, in the second half of the session. So um, if you could send them through to me, Louise Stokes, in the chat box as you think of them during the presentation by our presenters, um, you can also tweet uh, using hashtag DigiLeaders. Um, so you can send them through to me, Louise Stokes, or through to the account Digital Leaders. So um, in this webinar today, Jane Walsh of Enforced is joined by Matthias Wegmuller, the co-founder and head of business development at QuamRam, and Wendy Jepson, co-founder and chief behavioural scientist at Symbatix to discuss what RegTech can do and possible pitfalls to avoid in its use. Um, 20, 2017 is proving to be a year in which RegTech gains prominence and emerges from the shadow of fintech. The sector is brimming with innovative ideas that can help regulated firms address regulatory requirements in an efficient and cost-effective way. So I'll just quickly introduce you to our speakers and then I'll be handing over for them to run through their presentation. So Jane Walsh is the co-founder and CEO of Enforced, a RegTech startup that is on the Bank of England's FinTech Accelerator. Jane is a chartered fellow of the CISI and a financial services regulatory barrister who previously worked in the FCA's enforcement division in in-house at JB Morgan and as a consultant at Simmons and Simmons. Wendy Jepson is a business psychologist who models the human biases heuristics and conduct behind uh, decision-making skill into Symbatex Enterprise Behavioural analysis, ana Analytics. That was a bit of a mouthful. And finally, Matthias Wegmuller is a highly accomplished entrepreneur and digital transformation advisor. He has specialist experience working with mid to large size businesses, facilitating the effective execution of digital engagement initiatives. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to our presenters today. Jane, I'll just give you the keyboard and mouse control now and um, and away we go. Thanks, Louise. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you very much for dialing into our webinar, which we're delighted to be doing as part of Digital Leaders Week. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be joined today by both Wendy and Matthias, who are experts in their respective fields, and actually two of the most interesting people I know, I think, in the, on the reg tech scene, in terms of what they're doing. And there's nice pictures of us, if you want to see. Um, there we are. You, you've heard about our backgrounds. We're all, um, we're all co-founders and um, C-suite execs in reg tech firms at varying degrees of sophistication. So you've got cybernetics, Qumram, and then Enforce, and we know each other from, as I've said, the reg tech scene. And, and hopefully in this webinar, we'll give you some interesting insights from our own experience, what we're trying to achieve, how we think reg tech has the potential to really help the financial services industry, particularly, um, as it says in the blurb attached to the webinar, when it comes to improving conduct and culture so the idea of culture really is the holy grail of financial services currently so the regulators have been talking about it post-crisis really for a number of years now and saying oh culture's got to be improved behavior's got to be improved they saw with the LIBOR manipulation uh, and other uh, mis-selling scandals around PPI and in the retail space as opposed to the wholesale space that actually having huge volumes of regulatory rules isn't sufficient to prevent misconduct because it encourages a box ticking exercise and um, doesn't get you where you need to be in terms of treating your customers fairly and behaving well um, on markets. So the regulator acknowledges a gap around culture, wants people to improve culture, um, hasn't really told us what culture is. And what we want to explore today is is how RegTech can maybe support culture and the improvement of behavior uh, and what that might mean. So it's a topic that I personally find 
absolutely fascinating and we, we hope that, that you will find it interesting too. Please do submit any questions via the portal and we'll answer them um, towards the end of the webinar. We'll probably have our discussion for sort of 35, 40 minutes, something like that, if we can stick to that um, and then open it up for questions. So. Here's an agenda that we've put together. So we'll start off by looking at behaviour and decision making. And Wendy, who is a, a behavioural scientist, uh, as well as a co-founder of Cybernetics, so she really knows her onions on this, is going to take us through uh, what behaviour is, which again is, is absolutely fascinating. Uh, we can then look at the different areas um, the behaviour and decision making has an impact in financial services, so in, in funds. And I know that Wendy's been doing work looking at the quantification of the qualitative, so decisions that lead to to money being made or money being lost. So we'll talk a bit about that. Obviously, compliance and controls around behavior and decision making, customer retention and commercial decisions. So not just how you behave as a firm, but how your customers are behaving. Can you look at that and can you, you use that to drive better commercial decision making? And then, of course, staff and employee retention, which is extremely important too. Uh, Matthias is going to talk a bit about trust and transparency. Um, he's got some slides he's going to take us through. Um, using his expertise uh, uh, and what he's hearing from his clients and, and what his solution is, is looking at how they're helping people. Um, I will speak very briefly about enforcement risks and hopefully how avoid the, we can avoid these and then we'll conclude by just maybe giving a bit of a horizon scan, um, our views on how RegTech um, can improve culture uh, and maybe we can hear from you as well as to what your views might be um, on culture too. So are we right, are we wrong? So it'd be, be very interesting to hear what the audience thinks too. Okay, so at this point I am going to hand over to Wendy to kick off with human decision making and behaviour and what it is. Wendy. Let me see if I can give you control, actually, Wendy. Or you can just say next slide, and I'll 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 just click the next slide for you if that's easier. Hello, Wendy. Do we have Wendy on the line, Louise? Wendy was on the line, everybody. Sorry, slight technical hitch. If we can't get Wendy immediately, we'll just skip to Matthias, and then we'll come back to Wendy. Um, we might do that. Do. I think she she was on just before, but I think she might have to reconnect. So we'll she go. Was. I'll, I'll stop the slides and we'll go to Matthias's slides. Let's go to Matthias. Okay. Hello. Hello. Oh, sorry. No, Wendy's there. Wendy's there. Hello, Wendy. Sorry, Hi. we were just about to, we were just about to bump you off. Are you abroad today? Uh, no, I'm in Bath at a conference on decision making, actually. So oh, I'm great. Just, okay, that's work, appropriate. Working with technology. Um, okay, great. Okay, Wendy, so over to you. You have the have the stage. Thank you, um, and thank you for bearing with me. So I just wanted to spend five minutes really going through, you know, what is behaviour when we talk about this? And as a behavioural scientist, it is actually something that um, there are a huge number of people working on what is behaviour and how do we understand it? And actually, there is an agreed definition from um, the disciplines across, you know, a broad number of disciplines from psychology, sociology, anthropology, and economics. That actually, it is something, anything that a person does in response to internal or external events. So, in response to internal, is actually things that are going on in your body, like your heart rate um, and stress levels. External events are the things that are happening around you that influence you in what you do. Um, now, these are, so if you go forward to the next slide, they can be, these are actions, and they're either overt, so they can be motor, sorry, the next slide, the motor or verbal, you can literally see them and see, and therefore you can directly measure them, or covert, which might not necessarily be able to be observable. So again, things like heart rate or skin conduct, your, your levels of um, sweat on your skin, um, which change as according to your stress levels. And what's important, if you click to the next slide, next uh, piece, is that these are physical events that occur in the body and they're controlled by the brain. And people kind of think, well, you know, behaviors are these fluffy things and how do you measure them? But they are real physical things that we all do, essentially. And the piece that, about being controlled by the brain is important. So if we go to the next slide, I'm a behavioral scientist, but we do start with the brain. And if you go to the next slide, 
what we need to understand is about a little bit about the brain works and this is the emotional center to the brain which tends to be the oldest part of the brain and actually there's the green bit there's your hippocampus which deals with learning and memory and the dark blue bit there's at the amygdala which is kind of part of the it flashes to things that are new and there's probably that's probably going off in all of your heads right now thinking i thought i was at a reg tech talk and where's the tech where's the tech right now but if you go to the next slide the front part of the brain, which is what we typically think of as our mind and the executive control, works, works like the brake and accelerator on that emotional center. So this part will be saying, well, I did sign up to a reg tech talk, and I think there could be something interesting that I could learn from this. So I'll give it a minute, and I'll keep listening, and maybe the other two speakers will tell me something interesting as well. If you go to the next slide, those two areas that I've just described are connected up to the green and yellow bit at the top, which is the motor cortex. And that's literally connected to our bodies and what we will do next. So if you found, if you think you're about to learn something interesting, your front part of the brain is saying, okay, let's give it a chance. That part of the top is going to be saying, right, let's listen, let's pay some attention and let's not switch off just yet. Let's see what happens. So that all working together, if you go to the next slide, is actually our behavior. These are the things that we do and they are measurable. So we could measure at the end of this webinar how long do people listen to? What slides do they respond to? As I, get, as I said at the beginning, a definition of behavior, it's things that we respond to. And in this particular industry, financial services, on the next slide, this is described often as conduct, but it's essentially what we do and what we do in our organizations. Now, within our organizations of financial services in particular, if you go to the next slide, it tends to be lots of people thinking, you would think. So how on earth do you capture what people think about and what influences their decisions because you know largely it's the decisions that people make that are tripping people up in financial services but actually again coming from the discipline that I do if you go to the next slide this is an engineering challenge and then if you look at it like an engineering challenge you take apart all the nuts and bolts and literally the things that people do within their organization and understand how they work together and where the, the areas for potential friction are so that you can design better for the future going forward. If we would just move to the, my last slide, which now this is, this is actually taken from um, the human factors field, and it shows that actually by and large in the world, things work really well. You hear things in the news like the terrible fire, but actually they're relatively rare events nowadays because we've actually put lots of things in place in defenses which go along the bottom there. So you've got institutions or regulators who are writing rules in order to stop things from happening, from things going wrong. And then you have all the layers of the people, you know, parts with organization, profession and team and individuals that again are part of this defensive layer to stop things from going wrong. And the last one there, the technical one, is something that, again, can start to come coming into all of our organizations to make us more effective and stop the errors from happening. But you can see here, this is called the Swiss cheese model because it does have holes in it and things can suddenly can get through all those different layers of defense. But what we're trying to talk, to, uh, talk about today is really how do we look at, you know, right at that very first slice where you've got the regulators setting what the rules are, right down to the technological level. How can you design technology better in order to provide a, an increased protective layer to all of the slices in between of the people that are operating within the system and trying to deliver the intent of the, of the regulation so that you prevent the big blow up accident, the big LIBOR event, that type of thing from happening again. So that's where, that's the kind of the background to, you know, what behavior is, it really is what we do. We respond to the situation around us. We try to interpret the regulation. We try to marry that with organizational pressures and, and um, demands to achieve and, and perform. And at the same time, reduce the layers of potential for error and, and malfeasance both by training and other methods within the organization that affect people, but also by designing technology better to work with people so that they're aided in, in coming up with the better outcome and not so not persuaded in order to go down the, the kind of market abuse or poor conduct and cultural routes. So that's Wendy. That, yeah. 
Ahead, That's Dan. really fascinating. I just wanted to pause. I've put that, I've left that slide on there, the Swiss cheese slide, because something that occurs to me about that is you've put the tech at the very end. And it's interesting that all the other layers involve human beings and human behavior. Um, and, and so do you, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean that really the tech can only do so much and you've got, it's all about humans and then the technology comes in at the end or what? No, I would say, and this, this model, I mean, this is drawn up from 1991. So this is, and it, it's just, it's a conceptual model. So the te technology clearly comes in at all different layers. It's a touch point. So really this is just trying to say that actually there's, you know, by and large things do work well because you have lots of different people interacting, different layers interacting. The technical doesn't have to be at the end. It can be the thing that catches the you know, the the ultimate um, output. But it as as we know and as as what's happening every day now, that tech slice actually is a part of. You could see it as a patch over the holes at every single layer. Yeah, great. Well, could could you elaborate on on that a bit then? Maybe using your experience in the fun sphere because you've showed us those fascinating diagrams about how the brain works and you've got the emotional brain and then the um the logical brain and the motor brain um i mean if you're looking to monitor somebody's behavior with a view to firstly identifying what the behavior is and then what the triggers are and how you can prevent those triggers occurring how, i mean how do you even begin with that yeah, so it's a good question, actually. The, the um, conference that I'm at, at is um, full of world leaders and experts on precisely how do you do the bit at the start, which is understanding how people do their jobs in the first place. And you do it by qualitative analysis, which involves you know, going out into the field and you sit down with the people doing their jobs and you interview them using semi-structured interviews and you observe the way that they do the job and you use probes to ask well, so tell me the procedure that you followed. Now tell me when does that not really work and what do you notice and what do you, what resources do you pull on and how do you think about that? So it involves eliciting a whole lot of information that basically is baked in as expertise and has developed over time. The, all the workarounds that we all have to um, keep things going that we do every day. And that means once you, once you then gather together that information from having interviewed people, you run through it and you code it up to find out what are the common themes in that and then how do I use that information in order to design when and what information I should give somebody to, at the right moment. So for example, fund managers, incredibly busy people already got massive information overload. So if you're going to design a system that will provide them with the information, you have to understand how their day works. When does it start? At what point are they going to be you know, doing their first formal analysis of what's going on in the markets and what will follow as a consequence from having information. So that it might be actually what I need to do is make sure I've provided them with one summary piece of information before they're about to go into their news flow meeting, which is the first time that they summarize what's happening in, in their day in their team. And it, you don't know that unless you've been able to sit down and discuss with these people and understand and how does this work within organizations? And is this typical across that particular profession? Is this common across organizations? And find those touch points where it is similar. That's very interesting. And are you finding now there are there's an increasing body of work within financial services and the crossover with behavioral science, or not really? Are we, are we at the beginning of, of something? Yeah, no, I think we're really at the beginning of something. I mean, the, the, this is what I find particularly fascinating that this work has been done for literally decades in the other high-risk industries of the military and healthcare and aviation, um, but has not been brought into financial services, um, largely because I think the regulatory demands have, until the crisis, that's when the big pressure point came, and then the industry needs to be open enough in order to let people in, to have a look at it in a different way. But it's also the combination with new technology and data, um, which means that you can start analyzing to prove out, you know, well, if I, if I find out this information, can I design something better? Can I measure to make sure it works as well? So it's, yeah. a, it's a multiple factors that have meant that this is, they're now open to um, exploring behavioral science in a new way. It's fascinating because ultimately where this could lead if you imagine if there's enough if there's a big enough data set around the sorts of behaviors driving successful fund manager 
activity, then you can almost design a fund manager out of a box. And, and by comparison, I read a very interesting article recently about um, the selection of ballerinas. And I think they've always done this to a certain extent, but they've got an algorithm now that can look at a child aged five and predict to quite a high degree of accuracy whether whether they whether they've got what it takes to become well physically to become a leading ballet dancer and it's about the length of your legs and the length of your torso and it's very very computer based it's, it's it's interesting we could get to a point in financial services arguably where you you could weed out um people who are perhaps susceptible to behaving in a, a way that's um culturally inappropriate do you think and, and as i say that my thoughts are developing i'm thinking gosh this could get really big brotherish but what what's your view uh, well, I would say, so we've heard, had that before, so could you design the robo PM? And actually, what we know is that uh, we're still learning about how experts make decisions and how they combine complex information to come to a decision. It's very different to the way novices work. And we're, I think we're still, it's the difference between that and a ballet dancer is you have those physical aspects that you know are required to achieve a physical output. Actually, the role of a fund manager is to combine multiple pieces of information and make predictions going forward. And that's not something that you can put your recipe together for yet. You can design technology in order to support it, but it's not something that, that actually can replicate what the human brain does yet. And that's still some way off. And given the fact that we're, you know, I'm in a, in a room with complete leaders in their field have been doing this for 30, 40 years, who still stand up and say, we're still working on understanding the expert brain and how how we are so good, or the ones who are, are really good at it. And there is a difference between people who think they're experts and the ones who actually are. Um, yeah. <laughs> how they actually achieve that. So um, I think I'm pleased to say we're a bit of a way off that. Okay. Great. Well, that that's fascinating. Matthias, do you, do you have any views on what we've heard so far from your industry experience and in, in Qumran's solution? Well, first of all, I would like to thank Wendy for sharing this uh, piece of, of Swiss culture history, uh, being Swiss myself. And I, I promise to all of you, the next time I eat a piece of Swiss cheese, uh, Wendy will pop up in my mind and I, and I have <laughs> to think about me. That's why, why I think it's so great about these webinars. You know, you always learn new things. Um, either when you're listening or when you're talking. Uh, um, no, I, I, I think I fully agree. And, and Jane, you brought up a really good point. I think um, at this stage, with uh, a lot of digitization going on, we actually have the chance to, uh, to uh, capture and record more and more behavioral data and feed them into these scientific models and, and learn much faster than we learned in the past. And I think that's that's a big advantage, and that's actually a nice link also to to what Qumran does, um, is really bringing transparency um, into the system, into the banking world, um, and I think this this slide shows it quite well um, that we have, or the behavior of the people when interacting with banks today is completely changing. Uh, if we look at the rather right part of, of the slide, we see the branch, we see the ATMs, we see the call center. And these were the, the former touch points banks used to have when interacting with their clients and also interacting with, with their employees. It was mainly at the office. So it was a very all physical touch point. And as you see by the numbers below, it did not happen very often. Uh, you maybe went to the branch uh, one, once or twice per year and today, in the orange part, a bit more in the center, all of a sudden you have new channel, new touch points, and they're all digital. It can be via your mobile phone or through an online channel, um, or as we do it here, I have online meeting, online conferences instead of sitting in the same room. And this enables to have many more touch points in a certain uh, amount of time, which are a lot shorter. And that again, on the on the on the data collecting aspect, means we get a lot more data in the same period of time, um, and they're all digital. That means they're much easier to put in a in a in a in a model and to validate and gain insights out of that. And I think that's the the really nice bridge from uh, what Wendy was um, was saying and and what I'm going to be talking about. 
It is. That's that's fascinating, isn't it, Matthias? Because you're you're looking uh, so Wendy's, um, you know, cybernetics and Wendy's expertise lends itself to different things. But at the moment, they're very much looking at the behaviour of the individual in the regulated firm, whereas what you're now segueing into is looking at the behaviour of the customer and how the firm has to respond to that. So it's kind of two sides of the same coin, isn't it? Exactly, and it's at, and we are actually about sixty percent, you know, of our projects. We are uh, recording the digital behavior of uh, clients of the banks, and about forty percent is actually internal. So we are monitoring and recording the behavior of employees within the bank of a trader. Um, what does he do? Uh, if, where does he get his information before doing the trade? Um, what is he chatting with his colleagues before doing a trade, etc. So. It's both sides. It's employee and clients, and and the digitization is actually taking part on on both sides internally and externally, of course. Yeah, maybe if we jump on the next slide, then I can go in a bit um, how we do this. Um, on the left um, side, it's it's the recording part. No, maybe go one back. One slide back, apologies. Yeah, yes. no worries. So it's really high in, in on, on the left upper corner, we start with the recording engine. That's what, what our technology mainly does. Um, we record everything that happens on the web channel, on the mobile channel, and on the social communication channel. That's our latest and greatest innovation. So we are capable of recording a WhatsApp conversation, a LinkedIn dialogue, or even a, a WeChat um, dialogue if we go more into, into the Asian region. Um, and I think with this transformation um, into digital, more customer-centric uh, way, um, it will be more and more the clients deciding on which channel they will uh, want to interact with the bank. And uh, most likely, it will not be the, the channels that the bank is providing. So it will be, today it will be WhatsApp, um, in three years time we all know it will be something different because uh, the, the young gen is adapting so fast new apps and, um, and they're chatting and communicating on, on different channels in the future. Why do we do this? Why do we have this recorder? Um, it's in the first place um, really for compliance reason and that's where the rec tech from our part comes in. In order to have a proof point, in order to have an audit trail, if there is if there is a dispute, if there is a litigation, you can look at, at our um, recorded session and that's in a very easy, understandable and highly usable way. It, it, it appears just like a movie. You can just look at it and you see literally everything um, that has been going on. That's then the replay function. And of course, and that's then again, feeding the data into, into uh, Wendy's models to actually predict the future because you've actually seen what the employee or the client has done in the past, and you can kind of predict his next possible action um, on these digital channels. Yeah, can I can I just pause there for a moment, Matthias, and ask you a couple of questions and maybe do a deeper dive? So, the, I think the recording part, you know, technologically, it, you need the right systems to be able to do that. But you know, recording something we know that can be done. It seems to me that the replay and the predict are the really, really bits where you can really add value, but also that are very complicated. So if you're replaying um, and you're, you're, you know, you're trying to analyze what's happened, do you think you have at the moment the analytical capability to really see accurately what's been going on? Or do you think the measures basic and they're going to get a lot more sophisticated? So clearly you can look at you know, how much money somebody's taken out of their bank account or whether they've responded to a particular advert to buy a new product. But beyond that, to the more sophisticated analytics, are you able to do that yet? And also in the context of predicting what they're going to do next, because it seems to me that there's huge scope in, in that field. But I'm personally, I'm very keen for it to get beyond those really annoying adverts that have been put in place by some algorithm to target you based on what your last search was you know so i mean how sophisticated are we going to get going to get and how good are the analytics we have now do you think um first of all let me let me point out what what the replay does for you um what our technology tells you immediately how many of the thousand million sessions we let's take the example of an online mortgage so people are applying for an online mortgage and you all know you have to declare your salary uh, before you get a quote for a mortgage and quite often what happens then is 
that people, they start kind of playing around with their salary statement until they get green light for the mortgage. And with our system, you can pick all the ones out that actually change their salary statement, um, let's say to a trigger of 5% uh, more than initially declared, and all these will pop up. So then we have a certain number, and that's where the replay and the visual eye comes in very handy. Then you just look at the session, literally look at the behavior, and you see how they move their mouse, how they clicked, how they moved the bar across and how they changed. And that tells you a lot about their behavior. You know, was it only a typo? Was it only an error that made them correct them? Or was it actually an intentional um, form manipulation, um, a bad conduct, a bad behavior leading to that? Wow, In my my head's just exploded <laughs> since you said, you said that, Matthias. I had no idea that those sorts of mucking about on a bank's website would be recorded not that i've ever lied about my salary obviously but you know that the logical conclusion of all of this potentially is that the digital footprint that an individual has which has captured the these data points and their interactions with different organizations could ultimately indicate somewhere on some database that they are more prone perhaps to fraud or to you know over egging the truth all sorts of spooky stuff um i'm thinking could, could be held on people and perhaps we'll circle back to this in a moment but the whole idea of the the, the privacy um threats from from this technology which is very exciting but i think the more you think about it the more uh, the more complicated the the moral and ethical questions become i suppose absolutely and i think that's going to be the biggest challenge we'll all be facing and that's across industry across business and private lives um I'm a true believer that um, trust will only be built um, through uh, through transparency. So we're going to go definitely that way. But the tra um, data privacy aspect will be um, the critical one um, we as society has to deal with. And that's exactly when, when and who can actually see um, what you, Jane, did on any channel. And I think there will be um, a lot of political, sociological uh, discussion in the next years. And, we have to we have to accelerate that because technology is changing so fast it's giving us so much possibility and we learned from the past um, a technological change has never has never turned back so we need to find the answer on the on the cultural level on the on the moral and ethical level and that's that's going to be the big challenge yeah yeah fascinating perhaps we'll move on to your next uh your next slide yeah, if you do one more click, there is some more popping up. Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. I think for I think for the banks. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, no worries. I'll make it short. Uh, that's always our one million dollar slide. I think um, that's key that you start to think um, when protecting your business, that when when putting money and investing money into uh, be compliant and and discover and prevent fraud. Um, you need all these all these data and the behavioral data is definitely um, key and the digital of course because it, it will become um, at the time all digital but the important one from a bank cost perspective is actually to reuse the exact same data um, always with regard of, of data privacy of course as, as we discussed to use the same data to grow your business to do the innovation um, as an example, I do the recording of, of a WhatsApp, of a WeChat channel to actually be more customer centric or to have a better understanding of your mortgage calculator um, to improve a uh, user experience. And, and for me, yes, absolutely. And there must be quite a strong behavioral economics um, overlay to, to what you're doing as well. As you know, the FCA has been talking a lot about this and you know looking at how customer experience can be improved in terms of them getting the right product to, to service their needs but also how institutions are obliged now from a conduct perspective not to take advantage of any behavioral biases that individual customers might have so you know as you said they can discover fraud but the compliance aspect is you know the data and the, the the analysis of the data means that firms are going to be able to prove that they're compliant not just with the letter of the law and what you have to say to a customer but also prove that they're not unfairly manipulating the customer experience to get more sales so i'm thinking things like you know point of sale 
travel insurance when you've booked a plane ticket, you know, that sort of thing, how the framing of a financial product could lead many people to buy it when it might not be the best deal for them. So ultimately, you can you can run analytics that help help the regulator as well, I suppose. Exactly. And I say, reuse the data, not just within the bank, but share it uh, in the end, share it with your with your clients, because, you know, GDPR, the um, data protection regulation is coming up in May 2018. And there, every individual has the right to get all the data he had in, in a, um, interacting with the bank. And so share the data, not just with the regulator, which is for, for me uh, an obvious play, but also share data with your clients. And, and that will bring transparency into the entire system. And I'm repeating yeah. myself, that's the only way we can go. No, I agree with you. Perhaps we could pause and talk a little bit more about transparency and maybe get Wendy's view as well, because it seems to me that the power of this data and the power of RegTech is really going to become much more evident when we have reg techs, regulators, firms sharing these huge lakes of data that they're gathering. And then once you've aggregated and shared, you can then really see, you know, the, the big data analytics, you can really see what's happening to a much more sophisticated and, and hopefully beneficial beneficial degree. Um, but, but Wendy, I just wanted to, to ask you in the context of behavior, and you said the behavior is a, a response to internal or external events. I mean, ultimately, do you think that we might see behavior of individuals both in financial services firms and customers of financial services firms altering their behavior in response to the technological experience so in, re in response to their behavior being monitored and they know that every, every click they make is being tracked do you think that might cause them to, to change their behavior and what the implications of that yeah i think I mean, gaming this, the system? as you say we respond to everything and actually uh, matthias's slide saying how much we've we've changed our interaction with banks from because it used to be quite it's quite hard to go into your branch whereas now it's really easy to just have a look on your phone so your interaction has already been facilitated and changed because of the provision of technology. Um, and I, I completely agree with Matthias actually talking about you know, being able to increase transparency and reuse data for multiple purposes, um, which is, again, what we're also doing at Cybernetics. Because I think if you're capturing the way that people, you know, say fund managers are making decisions, or it could be um, a broker dealer in a bank or a relationship manager advising their high net worth investor, um, how they are um, making those trading decisions. You can then you think about the different use cases that you can put the same data to, to look at. So obviously our, our other use cases, reg tech, so compliance officers can look at how um, a trader is trading and have greater context around the decisions they're made, making in order to um, defend that that particular fund manager against any kind of suggestion they're doing something improperly um, because they just have more context around it and that can get reported up through yeah. the three lines of defense to what I think is the, the fourth line of defense back up to the regulator and the fact that you know you've got MIFID 2 requirements to report this data so you have this flow of data from the person at the sharp end making the decision all the way up to um, the regulator the FCA um, that you can then you you these these kind of diff you can get heat maps of how the, from the individual through to the team to organisations up to the you know the country level uh, that people are the way that they're behaving and again that that transparency and that information will feed back into the system and change the way that people behave again um, but it, and it comes back down to supporting levels of trust the more transparent you are even if there's um, mistakes made in the system and let's face it in fund management with a sort of an average success rate of about 53% um, of getting picking your winning securities people get it wrong a lot but if you can explain why and given the complexity of the job that they're doing and explain your rationale for how you managed a particular investment and why it made sense at the time to manage it in a certain way you're going to maintain the trust of the people's money you know, the people whose money you're investing on their behalf. Yeah. And that's what's really key and what's really, you know, it's got a huge potential in all of this data and the analytics and the technology that's coming our way. But lots of people yeah. forget when they hear about all the problems with things like LIBOR, they focus down on that individual who's at the sharp end. 
and they're not taking the helicopter view that I know that you've looked at with Enforced um, to see actually where are the common themes, where are people commonly tripping up with things that we should, where should we be focusing our attention to try and address these issues with potential technology? Yeah, and uh, that's 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 a very good point because the the point about the recording of, of behaviour and transparency and how that can improve trust is absolutely right because what what occurs to me as as we're talking is that with the LIBOR cases we saw time and again the traders who were involved and I've had personal experience of talking to more than one of them they all said the same thing which is that everybody was doing it we didn't know that it was illegal i mean i think they, i think they probably kind of felt that it was uh, not quite right but because everybody was doing it there's probably some behavioral reason for that wendy i'm sure but it wasn't the case that it was one or two bad apples with libor or, or forex it was widespread cultural issues across the industry which is why you know there was this, the, the 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 penalties were, were so high yeah. and it'd be interesting if we could reverse engineer some tech to have recorded the behavior of all of those individuals because then well a hopefully it wouldn't have happened because you've got transparency but B, you could then run analytics that I think would have made it much harder, arguably, for the criminal cases to succeed, although look, most many of them actually did fail. It was Tom Hayes who pleaded guilty, who's the main one in prison. Many of the others failed. But, you know, if the defense of those individuals who said, look, everybody was doing this, not that that is necessarily a defense, but if you could share that with technology, then you say, yes, there is a huge problem here um that you know that, that with, with transparency that that should never have happened but actually we can pin, pinpoint more accurately where the rotten apples are or where the cultural problems are and i don't think yeah. in most banks it wouldn't come down to a handful of traders it's many no. many more people than that yeah. many more people involved and yeah. you know that's a that's a meal that's been eaten that's in the past now hopefully but yeah. i think you can really see how important it is that that people use regtech and use this technology to to monitor for, for the benefit of everybody because you see this slide here that's from our data which is all of the cases actually where culture has been mentioned as an issue so cultural problems based on our analytics we mentioned as an issue in um in fca cases it's the most recent case and you can see that the aggregate level of fines is two billion pounds yeah. Um, for this, you've got the, mainly the LIBOR cases at the beginning, and then we go on to some some other sort of cases. So home serve is the next one. Big cultural problems there, which was that was around pile them high, sell them cheap. I think it was that one. So it was just selling all these you know rubbish policies to protect your fridge or whatever, and the policies that didn't pay out, they didn't work properly. So you know there's a number of solutions now that you would hope that would address that misconduct because clearly the case is 2014 but the misconduct was before then um and there and then the other cases going down as well and swinton's another really notable one for the for the poor conduct where the guys who ran swinton decided that if they were able to secure i think it was 10 million pounds worth of sales that they'd get a 90 million pound bonus to share between them which seems absolutely astonishing um, wow. that, that, that they thought that was ever going to fly. Um, but it does show, you know, very directly and starkly, the cost of misconduct is huge. And I think everybody yeah. knows that. But, but for me, I think what's interesting is not just the enforcement perspective, but it's the fact that with cultural misconduct, um, the regulator now is getting a lot more punitive if there's a cultural bent, I think, to a case. So, you know, things are always going to go wrong in, in firms. Yeah. They are. But if if a firm has you know done its best, there's been some external unpredictable event that's caused something to wobble. Um, you know the regulator might not take enforcement action. It might just you know some enhanced supervision might require a bit of compensation to be paid. Um, but the, the really punitive enforcement fines, I think we are seeing and are increasingly going to see where there are cultural problems, where tone for the top isn't right, and where behaviour has been poor. And, you know, as you've both pointed out, one of the main mitigating factors against behaviour being poor is, you know, clear expectations around behaviour. And then also the, the carrot and the stick, the monitoring of behaviour. So people, you know, people know uh, uh, what, uh, what they should do and you, you mitigate the risk of bad things occurring. Although it's interesting because I think it was it the chairman of, chairman of one of the big banks said that culture culture is what you do when no one's looking is it or you know good behavior is what you do when nobody's looking so the idea that you can monitor everything actually if, if somebody's bent and they know their phone is being recorded they're just going to use a pay-as-you-go mobile to manipulate the market so 
but even then i think there's still there's still ways you can mitigate that but i also yeah. wanted to show this so who's who's been facing enforcement action for cultural problems and you can see here the industry spread for firms versus the industry spread for individuals and it's interesting because for individuals um you've got many more independent financial advisors i suppose because the nature of their work you know they tend to operate alone rather than in a firm but far and away the biggest chunk is banks still um and i'm not sure why why that is are, are banks much worse than any other sector in the industry i don't know or is it just because they're bigger and they can afford to pay bigger fines i'm not sure but there, there are some interesting conclusions um and theories that you could draw from from the enforcement action that we've seen but of course the ultimate aim of reg tech is to is to prevent enforcement action because that's you know, that, that's that's the crystallization of a risk is what we're all trying to trying to guard against um yeah. okay well something that we haven't really touched on an awful lot just before we we go to questions is the impact of the the behavioral monitoring technology on staff retention and staff behavior maybe people feeling happier in their work is there any sort of positive things we can say about about how how the tech can can improve things for, for the staff member for the person in a regulated firm which i suspect is is probably most people who've dialed into the webinar well actually so uh, what i would say is but when we looked at it and i like Matthias, if you're looking at the same data for different purposes what you're really looking at in terms of behavior there's there's kind of three ways you can influence it. You can block it. You, you can literally lock it up, lock the doors, restrict access, make it not possible to do something. You can deter it or you can support it. Um, and then there's a detection level underneath it to, you know, keep, keep an, to actually measure what's happening and see whether or not any of these three things have an impact. Um, but if you're, if you're making clear you know, what bad behavior looks like and, and then focus on deterring. At the same time, you should also, it's also incredibly important to point out what good behavior looks like. And that's a piece that's often um, missed out because it's just assumed that people know what good behavior looks like and you don't need to tell people that. So that, you know, that's where training programs are obviously targeted. So the more that you can do in order to use this data to support people and say, Actually, this is what good looks like. And this is, you know, one of the um, fallouts from our compliance software, Compass, is the fact that we provide compliance officers with better information, of, you know, a better understanding of what, what their um, portfolio manager was doing when they were investing, what was happening at the time, um, contextual factors around the news and their investment thesis means they go and ask smarter questions, which means that portfolio managers are having a better engagement with compliance and and will come and we've seen them coming to to tell compliance before they trade and say your system might be flagging me up you might be asking me questions about this let me tell you about it before i trade so that's a good example of what good conduct looks like and again you can measure that with technology so you can start to capture that interaction and you have a metric of good conduct and then if you use that to model this is what good behavior looks like in the organization then you can encourage and support people to you know, work towards the things that people feel good about and what great performance looks like. And it has that knock-on effect. Again, it's a response to something that you've been shown and you know why it's valued within your organization. And again, it goes up the cultural layers of, you know, as long as your organization going up is valuing these particular types of behavior, they're going to be supported and encouraged and replicated. Yeah, so I think absolutely. it's a really key issue to also focus on you know, what does good look like? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because um, you can't you can't give everything to the technology. You know, there is, the, you know, training and, and people guiding each other and helping each other. I think it's important too. Yeah. OK, we've we've got about 10 minutes, I think, left before we're on the hour. So um, yes. please, I don't know if you want to moderate any questions. Yeah, certainly. So um, we've got a few questions through and do send them through as you have them, everyone. Um, so we'll first go to Kieran O'Shea. Kieran, do you want to ask your question out loud? Yes, of course. Yeah. Good afternoon. Kieran O'Shea, you are the Building Society Group. Um, I'd be really interested in the panel's view as to the fact that with there being so many reg tech solutions available on the market, um, as a regulated firm, how would the panel suggest we decide where to focus our efforts, resource and, and indeed investment? Um, yeah, there, there, there are quite a lot of solutions out there. I suppose what you need to do first is identify where you think technology might be able to help or where it might be able to save you money. Um, further on from that, 
I suppose it's a case of um, plugging in. To, I mean, you know what needs to happen? There needs to be a massive reg tech conference, like a marketplace type thing where everybody's pulled together and we can say, right, here's a solution for a bank or for a building society or for an asset manager. And there's some sort of um, platform. I don't think such a thing exists. So, Wendy and Matthias, what ideas would you have on that? It's quite a tricky one. I would say I think it's a really good question and I think what we we see a lot of kind of decision paralysis actually because there is so much out there who's any good do they actually solve my problem do they understand what I do um, and it's a big challenge actually and I you know I used to be a lawyer in house and we have the same you have new reg legislation come in well practically how do I interpret that well what's everybody else doing let's have a look and let's just wait a bit and see what everybody else is doing and we see quite a lot of that um, happening with the market abuse legislation and with the two where you're required to have a system. Well, okay, so who, who's got something and does it work? It's a lot of what's happening out there. Um, and I think that's a big challenge to know because everyone's got a neat website and, and a slick demo and, um, and you, there is a bit of a pain barrier to go through in understanding, you know, what matters to me. So what, you know, and I think there's, there's an internal um, piece of work to be done to say what are what are my biggest pain points? Where do I think the highest risks are in my organisation? Um, and the reg tech solutions out there they do put themselves in categories like we have market abuse. Um, so what are the market abuse and do they cover the things that I think I need? Do they actually cover the market abuse type questions that I know I've been looking at forever because I've you know it's not like market abuse is new but there's other things that I need to know. Do they do, um, you know, what's integration like? What's case management systems like? Do they understand my job and how I think about the data that I analyze? Because I don't want to be given a, a ton of false positives and have to hire somebody to look at this stuff. Um, so there's a kind of a list of questions to understand what are the key things that there are for you? And then it's a bit of a, it, there's two ways you go about, I mean, we always say, talk to clients that use us because they're the best recommendation you can get rather than us giving you a sales pitch. Um, so it is trying to find people who are actually using solutions rather than ones that are still prototypes or just haven't been tried and tested yet. Yeah, I mean, I also think that another avenue, although you might not want to do it, but the, the big consultancies are actually quite good at aggregating decent fintechs and reg techs. So our, our reg tech, we did the Accenture Fintech Innovation Lab. There's also, there's various other accelerators. And they, I mean, they get sort of between 600 and 1,000 applications and they take about 20 companies. And they partner with financial institutions. So you can approach them. I know Deloitte do a lot as well. Um, and they then introduce you to different technology companies that might be interested. So that's, that's another avenue. But I, I do think there is space for some sort of portal kind of reg tech portal here's all the solutions used by these different firms and, and the, or, you know so people can see all in one place it's ironic isn't it that within technology the reg techs themselves haven't been able to get together and um, and do that I mean th that is a good suggestion though because I'm actually um, we're all involved with the International Reg Tech Association which is actually a new thing which is an independent um, association but I might suggest to them that maybe on the website they have some sort of information um, area um, yeah, but it, it's not easy to find the good ones. Yeah, as Wendy said, ask, asking around, which again is not a very technological approach. But we have a couple of no, questions. No, from... maybe, maybe maybe just one one quick input from my side. I mean, it's a new field, um, so I think RegTech Association is a, is a great place because it's internationally it combines banks, regulators, and actually um, RegTech providers. Um, but in the end, it's it's what Wendy said in the beginning. It, it's a cultural decision. If you're rather a typical um, uh, compliance officer from from the days before, and you wait till others act, or you're one of the new gen, and you you're a uh, your brain, the green and yellow part, I think it was on, on Wendy's brain chart, is is rather big, and you move into action. And I think today, with the with the agile uh, movement in technology and and in your IT departments, um, you have to try out and fail. Um, because then you could be a, a first mover in the rec tech field as well and actually gain competitive advantage out of that instead of just waiting till, till the others in, in the industry do it. Excellent. Thanks, Matthias. I think this next question from Marcus, who doesn't have a microphone, so I'll ask it, is for, directed, I think, at you. Um, Matthias, he says, uh, you talk about 100% compliance with regulation. How do you deal with voice, especially natural 
in brackets, trade to speak language? That's a really good question, Marcus. Um, and there are voice recorders in, in place. Uh, Qumram is not doing it because it's a different discipline uh, to record voice and then actually to transfer voice to text. Um, but there is a lot of, of good good companies, good technology out there um, to, to, to do this. And then we can put it together and have it in all, all in one place to actually have it as, a, as an omni-channel um, and data source. Excellent. We probably have time for one more question. I will um, also mention, though, I'll connect everyone who registered to the webinar today to our presenters so you can continue to ask them any question you have. And also we'll continue the conversation on Twitter using hashtag DigiLeaders. Um, but the final question that's come through on Twitter is, what do you think will be the biggest innovations in RegTech over the next five years? Um, I'll, I'll go first on that. So my view is that the position that we need to get to is joined up RegTech. So RegTech that's joined up at the code level with regulatory requirements and internal firm requirements. So the RegTech is embedded somehow. And I think we're going to get that as the regulators move to machine readable versions of their handbooks. So what I'd like to see is you get the reg tech talking directly to the handbook, talking directly to the internal systems of the firm. So a practical example of that, say you've got a fund manager, I've got fund manager on the brain because Wendy's on the call. Say you've got a fund manager, um, he's got some reg tech that's, um, that's, that's monitoring what he's doing. He wants to click and get some advice on something. He's got a reg tech uh, widget on his screen, but that also links into all the regulatory underlying regulatory rules that he needs to comply with that might also link to the internal firm policy and might link even to a chat board with a compliance officer to get some advice on a specific situation. So for me, it's about integration and reg tech talking to um, lots of other bits of data within organizations. So you reduce the friction. So it's not lots of different systems. It's basically much more integrated, but legacy systems, lack of budget, these are all the barriers to that happening, but I, th I think it will happen. Yeah, I think I'd add to that. I think in the last four years, I've seen a huge shift in, in attitude to, and openness to try out new things. I was, at a, I was in Harvard with a group of 35 um, people, US regulators, other regulators around the world, including the FDA, who are phenomenal reg tech companies and um, the regulated talking about well, how do we how do we get design regulation better and design technology to support it within financial services so we have this broad approach to get it right from the beginning right at the blunt end down to the sharp end of where people have actually got to put it into practice and I, the speed with which it's going is extraordinary so I think it, we're going to see massive changes over the next five years in many many areas Yeah, I, I would I would agree, and, and the speed will um, will tell. Probably the scenario Wendy created will not be within the next three five years, but definitely within ten years. Um, uh, and openness is the key. Um, openness technology through APIs have an open standard for everyone, so everyone gets connected to every system. Um, we have IT legacy which cannot do that. Some of the core banking systems are now opening up; the other ones will disappear. Um, and then openness in, in, in the man top management of the banks. The ones that will open up will stay, the other ones will disappear. Um, and, and, and probably they can protect themselves. And if the regulator, it's probably the, the biggest protector of the not open managed banks. Um, and that's why the regulator has a, and the government have a big, big, big role in, in that change as well. But I think only on the timeline. Um, maybe they can postpone this openness and open banking for a few years, but um, in, in 10 years' time, only the, the sharing ones will remain. That's my personal opinion. Excellent. We're probably just about out of time. Um, as I mentioned, this webinar is fully recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube with the slides and the audio. So you're welcome to watch that back and share that as you wish. Thank you so much, Jane, Matthias and Wendy for your um, expertise and showing that today and thanks everyone for joining in and uh, asking your questions. I will also include in the follow-up email those two links that um, Kwamram and Joshin has um, put in the chat box as well. Um, thank you everyone and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks thank everybody, you. bye. Thank you.